Welcome to Super Agents Live. This is the one place where you can come and hear the most successful people in real estate. You'll hear how these super agents built their businesses, how they stay productive, and how they stay motivated. Who am I? My name's Toby Salgado, and I made my first million in real estate. And I'm your host for the next 30 minutes while we talk to yet another amazing real estate entrepreneur. Stay tuned. Let's go. I am really excited to have today's guest on the show. This is a guy who went out and got an MBA and then did what all MBAs aspire to do, go out and kill it on Wall Street. He was on Wall Street. He quit Wall Street to sell real estate for a higher income potential. I've been fortunate enough to spend some time with this person on the phone. And this guy is a wealth of knowledge. I've learned a lot just by trading some emails with him. I am thrilled to welcome Sharon Stravatsa. Hey, Sharon, thanks for taking the time out today. Hey, Toby, great to be here. And you do such great work. Thank you for having me on the show and looking forward to sharing some great things with your, with your audience. Awesome, man. And I hope I didn't butcher your last name. Hey, oh, it's perfect. So, so listen, you, you have a really rich background. So, Sean, before we get into, you know, again, we traded some emails uh, on trying to figure out what we we're going to cover today. And we kind of landed on, you know, a, a geographic farming. But before we get to that, take a minute, tell us a little bit about yourself and your business. Well, Toby, it's been, uh, it's been a wild ride for us. Um, what I do day to day is this. I, me and my partners, we run a high-end real estate firm in the luxury markets of Central and Southern California. We have 11 offices uh, all the, as far north as Carmel, as far south as Laguna. Um, the company's name is Telus Properties. We have about 300 agents. And last year, we did a little over $2.2 billion in sales, and we were named the fastest growing uh, real estate company in California by Inc. Magazine. So it's been, a, it's been a fun ride for us, and all we care about is building a great platform for our agents to just go out there and crush it. That's awesome. And look, you know, one of the interesting things that I learned about you is, you know, you call yourself your non-selling partner in the business, but you do go out and help your, help your agents close deals. Tell us a little bit about that, and tell us, give the audience your closing ratio, which is crazy. Well, I, we, um, the closing in the last 12 months, uh, my, partner, my partner Peter Hernandez, who you've had on the show, is a great show. My partner Peter and I have been on 68 listing appointments in the last 12 months, and we've closed 67 of 68. Unbelievable. So that is a perfect segue into wh- why did you lose that one? Well, that's, the, the, the reason we lost that one was because we went, went up against this, uh, the other agent going up against, that we went up against was a geographic farmer who's been in that neighborhood for a long, long time, and we just, we just were not able to shake, shake, you know, shake them out. And so that's what has really kind of made me and my partners really focus on uh, getting our age to focus on being good, solid geographic farmers, because if not, if not for them, if not for a geographic farmer, we'll, we'll, we'll get every listing. Right, right. So you have some interesting ideas. So, uh, so unpack that a little bit, because you have some interesting ideas on, on digital home base and outposts, and you have some interesting metaphors around you know, football. But so, so in terms of geographical farming, I mean, talk to a little about that. How do people choose a farm? Uh, go ahead, because I... Yeah, so I think, I think um, Toby, there's a lot of you know, discussion out there about, I've read a different, tons of different websites on how you pick a farm and you only have to pick it with X ratio and, and all that is, is, is really fascinating to me because none of those apply to every market in the country. And so we've, even in just in our markets, we have agents that sell, you know, a, a one of our agents is going to do 125 deals a year at $600,000 a deal. And then I have, have another agent today that's closing, you know, the largest sale in Laguna. So we have a wide range of people who sell different types of real estate. But I think there's a, I think there's a formula of source or a framework to think about uh, how a geographic, uh, how to pick a farm. And it's very simple. You pick the total number of homes in a market. You figure out what the average sales price is. You figure out the velocity, which we call the turnover, and you also figure out you know, whether there's a dominant agent in the market or not. A lot of times I say, hey, the dominant agent is any agent that has you know, 8 to 10 or north of 10% market share. Once you do these, you can kind of figure out, and when you do it across three or four markets, Toby, you figure out, oh, wow, there are 400 homes in this market, but there's one person turnover. There are 300 homes in that market, but there's seven person turnover, which means more homes sell in that market. 
if I were going to invest any time or effort or dollars, I should probably invest it in a market that has the ability to turn over more, especially if that's the farm that you know, people are trying to get into. If, if there are other intangible reasons where you grew up in that area, et cetera, that's great. But breaking into a farm that has low turnover is so very, very difficult. Yeah, because there's low turn. I mean, so it's interesting. So you could, um, you know, and look, you can, so there's older homes, there's newer construction, right? Newer construction on average is going to have a higher turn than older ones. Um, if you had a farm with a low turnover, let's say, let's say 2%, I don't want to get your, your thoughts on this, but let's say it's 2%, right? You, you, you know, um, um, but the average sale price is $5 million, right? So maybe you're not going to do as many deals, but you know, you know, if you owned a good portion of that turn, I don't know. What do you think about that? Cause there's, there's, you can, you yeah, can segment great, the market yeah, that way. Yeah. Yeah. Great idea. I think that, um, I think that it's important if, if you have a farm like that, it's almost also important to have another farm that you supplement with units. Mm. Cause I think that the toughest thing that people do is they, base their production based on their total average production for the year. And, and unless you have unit growth, it's going to be very, very hard to sustain and build a, you know, a, a, a just a repeatable, clean, sustainable business, which is why um, it's great to have a farm. You know, the, the high-end farming is a great idea, but the interesting part of the high-end farming is also take a lot of money. Mm. Uh, you got to, you, you got, you, you also got to have a lot of persistence. You got to have a lot of patience and people kind of struggle with the high-end farming because there's only so much you can do. I mean, in, in a $5 million farm, you can't you, take Newport Beach, for example. There are parts in Newport Beach you can't door knock. Well, you can't door knock it. That's kind of weird because a high-end farm, if it's a $5 million home, are they going to be responsive to door knocking? Maybe not. Is, it, are they gonna, is someone else going to – are they going to just look at your direct mail and just trash it? I don't know. Maybe. Right. Can you drop off things at the door? That's tough. That means now, you're, now you have a farm – that you can't really do much with. But in a high unit farm, that's why not only do the tangible factors of the farm matter, but also do you have access to the farm is such an important thing because like, as soon as you, if there's a gate, you're done, right? You, there's, there's, so many, there's so many fewer things that you can do with a farm. Totally. And if I think about like my neighborhood, so I have a gate, right? So you can't get past, well, you can actually walk around my gate, which is kind of weird. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but, you know, so I have a gate, number one. Number two, uh, if you send me stuff in the mail, I don't, I don't look at my mail, so you're not going to reach me that way. And number three, right, so, and then the other thing, right, um, you, even if you walked around my gate, which you could, because that side of my property doesn't have a fence, which is, you know, it, it, we, I have an acre and a half here, so just that side doesn't have a fence. But even if you walked around and put something on my door, I don't, I don't even use my front door. I, I drive into the garage right. and go through my house that way. So that's interesting that you make, that's a ton of good points. So, so let's say we find, again, so help us, let's go back for a second. So, you know, focusing on uh, that kind of a, a high-end farm is not going to be good. Take us through a, a little bit more of if, you know, uh, uh, what does, should your ideal farm look like for units? Well, it, we've come up with some, some very basic math. And so the, the basic math kind of centers around something like this. If you, can, if you can get, you know, at some point, 5 to 7% market share. So all, all, I, all I talked about by my agents is, this, hey, what's your goal? So if they say, well, my goal is $100,000 in GCI, great. And then I say, well, if you can make 75% of that goal from a farm, then that farm has the ability to support you. If not, it doesn't. So otherwise, there's no reason investing in a farm like that. So let's say 100000 the goal of, of, of our agent is $100,000, say $75,000, they can, a farm can support them. Then that comes down to, well, what does it mean that a farm can support them? So let's say, um, if they can get five to 7% market share and that can generate 75% of their goal, that means that farm has good potential to support them for the long term. If not, they should be, they shouldn't even bother. Okay. And then, okay. So let's say that they, they've identified a good, a good, a good geographic area for themselves. How do they, you know, what, what, you know, what are the approaches? What should you start doing day one? Right. So I, I just figured it all out, Sharon, you know, what do I do now? Well, it, I actually think, uh, geographic farming in today's world couldn't be any easier. And I almost believe that, um, you should start, you should start it from a digital world. Hmm. Um, but let me actually give you a funny story, right? There, and there's only one exception to that. Here's the funniest story. I was actually, uh, we, we moved to a new home 
and I'm out talking to uh, my neighbors. And I, you know, we have a big for sale, you know, sold sign in front of my house and has the tell us our company's, you know, for sold sign on front of it. And they're like, hey, what do you do? And I kind of tell them who I am and what, the, what I do. And one of my neighbors says to me, oh, isn't there a guy who sells everything in this neighborhood? And so I look at him and I say, really? Who's that? And so he tells me who this, you know, who he thinks this guy is. And I, and I, and, and I stop and think about it, and it, would just, it just blew my mind because let me break this down for you, Toby. So this guy who, who my neighbors thought sold everything in the neighborhood has never sold one house in the neighborhood, does not live in the neighborhood, does not mail to the neighborhood, has never door knocked in the neighborhood, has no friends in the neighborhood, has never done any digital ads in the neighborhood, does not own the Zillow zip code for the neighborhood, has no connection to the neighborhood in any way. How, how, what happened? How'd that guy come up with that guy's name? And here's, here's the amazing part. This guy has, we have about 400 homes in our neighborhood, you know, higher, you know, 1.5 million average sales price point, whatever. But this guy has had one overpriced listing for mm. the last six months that he has put his signs out every Saturday and Sunday for the last six months. Got which is, it. Which is amazing to me, right? Yeah. And so starting from, apart from that, apart from the signage, uh, you know, I think if, if I, one of our agents was trying to get into a new, new farm and I said, if you can find a FISBO or if you can find a Zillow Make Me Move, if you can find somebody that would just allow you on Saturdays and Sundays to either hold an open house or at least put up signs. It, there's, there's nothing more amazing for community-based branding for an agent to take over a geographic farm. Right. Yeah, that's, that, that's interesting. Yeah, I, mean, I was just going to ask that. I was going to say, well, how do you get signs up you know, in the neighborhood without, without – um, so is there uh, – so, okay, so you go find a FISBO, you go find a Make Move Zillow and say, hey, let me list it. Uh, have, have you put any thought into what other ways that you could, I mean, could you pay somebody, you know, 50 bucks a month and drop a sign in their yard? I, I, don't, I don't know if that's <laughs> legal or not. I, I think, I mean, I, I think people can get creative like that. I think that might be a little disingenuous, but I, I'm not sure. You know, I think um, maybe that's the lucky break, Toby. Maybe that's the lucky break that people need. And, and that's why I think when you start having access to the farm and knowing there should be no expired in the farm that you haven't talked to. There should be no FISBO in the farm that you haven't talked to. There should be no Zillow Make Me Move in the farm that you haven't talked to. With the goal of, and the only goal of having, of getting your, you know, of getting that listing at whatever, at whatever commission, right? Yeah. At whatever commission. Right. Just to get those signs up on your first one so that you can start to believe and make the people around you believe the perception that you own that farm. Yeah, I love it. And look, and, and, and for your farm, you know, here's what I tell, here's what I tell, the people that I coach, here's what I tell them. You know, I say, number one, it's a three, and you've heard me say this before, but I'll say it for, if you, people haven't heard it, but so, so number one, in terms of, there's active marketing or prospecting, and then there's passive, in my mind. So the active stuff that I, that I encourage people to do is, right, you door knock, you mail, and if you don't have, you know, if you have a 1,000 house farm and you don't have enough money to mail, right, so when you door knock, you know, have your little, postcard flyer or whatever and leave something on the door so it's kind of like a mailer and then and then thirdly the third piece of that is to you know use you can use a land voice data or or there's another one i forget but you know they get, they can get you the phone numbers to that farm right so then you do inbounds into the farm so that's all that's all active prospecting and then the passive stuff that you do is you know you should have magnets or your name on your car that that shows that you are an agent because when you park your car to door knock or you're you know at the in the farm right eating lunch or going to Seven Eleven or whatever people see you there, um, right? And, you know. So anyhow, um, and there was another one that in terms of passive, I totally just blanked on. Oh no, no problem at all. So I mean, I think that leads us into into, into the geographic farming, which you and I talked a lot about in the digital world. And if if I were to start a farm today. There would, there would only be two things that I would do. One, it would, it would just find a way to try to get that overpriced listing where I can put my signs out and just dominate so that. So I don't even want to sell it. I just want my signs out every single time, every single weekend, Saturday and Sunday. And the second thing that I would do is I would just dominate and, uh, on every single digital resource that's out there because um, that's, that's the world. That's, this is a smartphone hyper-targeted, hyper-local world that we live in, and what a great way 
uh, that you know the gateway that we've been given to these people in this farm. So, to me, geographic farming in the digital world could could not be easier. And you and I talked about this broadly. Is the focus is you know one goal and one goal alone is to create a platform so that we can be heard, right? And so um, Michael Hyatt, who I don't know if you've heard of Michael, he sure. he's, he wrote this awesome book called Platform: Get Noticed in a Noisy World. Great read for uh, for your audience. And he talks about a really cool model, and he says. You have a digital home base, which can be your website, your blog, and a, a, one place in cyberspace that you control where you, do, where you have all your magic. And everything else is an outpost, which basically means that Zillow, Trulia, Twitter, Facebook, etc., all of their, their jobs is just to find a way to drive leads to your website so you have a, so you have a prayer of converting them. That's all it is. And, and as soon as people kind of it's not a complex model to get a hold of, but I think as soon as people kind of understand that framework that you put a lot of time, energy, and love into your home base and use every other outpost as an opportunity to, con- you know, to drive people to your home base so you can convert, then you have people you know, who, are, uh, who actually are trying, you know, who are trying to get leads on Facebook and then they get frustrated. Well, they're like, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get leads on Facebook and Facebook's useless. Well, Facebook's not useless. You're just using it the wrong way. You're not no one's going to just you know, like your page on Facebook and then come ask you to list their house. That's just never going to happen. Right. Right. And so can you, is there a way to drive them to your home base so that you can start to convert them in some way? And as soon as, and all the money and the, and the, and the technology and the ability to convert goes into your home base and because the outposts come and go, right? So Facebook is hot for a while, then Pinterest is hot for a while, and then Twitter's hot for a while, and then you've got, you know, you, you've got uh, uh, landing pages, et cetera. Who cares about all of those at the end? If you use them as a concept of an outpost, you're just saying, at the end of the day, my website rules and I control that. It would be great if I can just drive all the traffic to my site so that then based on the audience that I actually have driven, I can use, I can try to convert them in some way. I love it. So, and I, and I, I have read that book. I read that early on before I launched um, this, uh, this podcast. But so uh, let me tell you, let me tell you a funny story. <clears throat> this actually happened to me today. So my dad called me this morning and he wants to start a little, he's been a contract for a long time. And he wants to start a little home inspection business, right? So he said, Toby, how do I, what, what do I do here? So I, I walked him through it and we talked about having a website. And I said, well, you don't need a website like immediately right now, but you do need, need to have one. And, and, then, and then he said, well, he said, yeah, but, but if I have one, uh, then I'm, when people type in home inspection San Diego, like I'm going to come up first. I'm like, Are, what? Because he, he's in his 60s, right? He's like 68. So he thought, he's like, if I just have a website and, you know, and people type it in, like I come up first. And I, and I bring that out because, or, or I say that because, I couldn't believe, number one, he thought that. But number two, you know, NAR came out with, uh, with some stats recently, and the average age, the average realtor is 57 years old. These guys have a hard enough time wrangling their own email, Sharon. I mean, you, I'm sure you see this a lot. Sure. What, you know, in terms of outposts, like, like uh, let's talk about this a little bit more. So, you know, people know, yeah, I mean, you mentioned Facebook, Pinterest, Twitter, landing pages. I'm not sure that everybody understands what that is and how they could use it. But how can people use these outposts to drive traffic back to their site? You know, that's a, that's, that's a, that's a great way of thinking about it. So let's actually kind of unpack that a little bit to use, to use your language, oh, right? right. So yeah, call, I love it. <laughs> we call this the, you know, I, I talk about this often internally, and I call it the conversion pyramid. And we call it the holy grail of lead generation is you got to have some kind, you got to have some kind of conversion pyramid because, and what I mean by that is you've got to find a way to get, you know, the, the cold prospect, the cold person that somehow touched you somewhere in cyberspace to help them get to know more of you over time. And, and, and it's very, very simple. It's, they got to know you, number one, they got to like you, number two. They got to trust you, number three, and they got to think you're smart, number four. So let's let's talk about knowing you, right? So knowing you is important. So they say, hey, it's a, just like your dad said, if he had a website, he's there, but nobody knows him. The only way for people to know him would be if he, uh, you know, posted a great article on Twitter saying, uh, you know, top ten tips for 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 you know while you're looking for a contractor. And so that's like, oh, top ten tips for looking for a contractor, Mr. Salgado. Okay, there's there's the Salgado name coming out. So they start to see him and know him, which is interesting. Then they got to like you. So 
I, I think in the new world, voting, uh, when people vote, they click, right? That's it, that the click is the vote of the, of the modern right. world in a lot of ways. Yes. So, so if, if, if I go, if I say, oh, wow, I'm seeing a lot of things from, you know, so, you know, the, Mr. Con, Mr. Salgado, the contractor, then I say, oh, wow, let me see if he has a Facebook page. I look on his Facebook page and I click like. Well, now I'm saying, wow, okay, I'm liking him. I'm actually saying I know him, now I'm liking him. What else do I do here? Then there's, you know, you're starting to show up in people's Facebook feeds or Twitter feeds, et cetera, but then there's, maybe there's a lead magnet or a call to action that says click here for 10 ways that you can increase the value of your house with small projects. Well, I'm like, oh, cool. I'm a homeowner. I want to do 10 small projects to increase the value of my house. I click on it, and it asks me for an email address. Well, now I'm opting in because I trust Salgado contra- contractors to send me something of value. And, you know, Toby, you and I call that a lead magnet. You want to give them something so that they trade you their contact information in return. Yep. And now they've opted into receiving something. And after that, wow, now they know you, they like you, they trust you. After that, hopefully the content that we provided was pretty good and they think we're smart. After that, now they want to talk to you or work with you or refer you. But till then, it just blows my mind when people tell me, hey, someone just bumped, you know, I, I've been advertising on Zillow and I haven't gotten anything. Well, they don't have any form of conversion funnel. They don't have any form of getting them to social proof where they want people to like them. They don't have any opt-ins. They don't have any way to let them let our, 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 our prospects trust, like us and trust us, how do, how do we expect them to do business with us? Sharon, I, I, I can tell you, man, you are the first person in the history of this show to actually come on and, you know, I mean, look, maybe this is the MBA in you, I don't know, but I mean, you are, if, you, what you're really talking about is merging what internet marketers do, you know, taking this new internet marketing idea uh, and merging it with selling real estate i'm not nobody's doing this and i think if if people could do this and would do this i mean i think i mean they would they would rule their their area how come this hasn't caught up how come how come people how how come nobody uh, you know have you seen anybody do this well uh there are very few people that do this well um and and i've actually kind of spent a lot of time working with these folks one one person that does this really really well is um, Chris Spiker and Peggy Lynn Spiker, the Spiker Group out of Maryland. Um, I they bet Chris are, on the I'm show. Very close. Yeah, just, I mean, and you know Chris, awesome, awesome, awesome kind of, you know, just a, a guy that, that thinks, he thinks th- 10 steps through the process. He thinks about the client experience. It's not just generating leads and trying to get people to close. And he's like, hey, if I generate a lead, this person already knows me, likes me, trusts me, and... Therefore, buyer's agent, A, you should have no problem closing this lead. And if you, if you do have a problem closing this lead, you shouldn't be my buyer's agent because you're useless. Right, right. Uh, uh, which, which is amazing. And Chris and I, and you know, I'll, I'll, there's, there's one sm- it, Chris and I talk about this often is uh, there's a lot of chatter about Facebook out there right now. And we talk about, hey, people are doing Facebook ads. You know, Tom Ferry came on and he had a great show with you talking about how, for example, generating seller leads by doing – you know, these home valuation ads. I bet you've yeah. seen a ton of those out there oh, right yeah. now. There's, they're so saturated, which is, it's okay. And I, and I think it's the right thing. We, we've been doing them in the last few weeks. You know, even ours has dropped off. Not a lot, not a lot of click-throughs. But even in Facebook, just the simplest of things, people don't understand the difference between when you boost something and when you do an ad. And, and, and it's, those, are, those, are, those are two very key components of how you run a home base and how you run your outposts. And, and I, maybe people don't know, but when you boost something, you're boosting it to your friends and the friends of your friends. So people in some way are connected to Toby Salgado. So it's nice to boost something to them where there's a connection of sorts. So if you have a new listing and you boost the listing to them, that makes sense because they're like, hey, Sharon's friend Toby just showed, you know, boost has a new listing and that shows up in your feed. And that's, there, there's at least one or two degrees of separation there, so that's actually a fair thing to do. But you can't just use an ad and say, oh, for all homeowners, or you know, for, all, for everybody that lives in 90, 90210, show this ad, and if they don't have any context to you, then you've got to show them some, a complete set of different messaging, which, I, which is why I think that always thinking about conversion is important. Otherwise, you're just throwing stuff out there and getting frustrated that you're not getting any leads. 
Right. Now, well, look, so so help me understand this, Sean. So you, you, obviously um, we're spending a lot of time talking about digital stuff. What trumps, right? I mean, so you have the old school, you know, the Mike Ferry way of thinking, you know, you know, or, or even, you know, Gary Keller, right? <clears throat> you know, you mail and you door knock, right? And that's really Mike. But so, you know, that's that's old stuff. <clears throat> and then you have this new digital stuff. And where should people be spending their both their time and their money if, if you if you were going to develop your farm? Um, it's a good question. I think it, sadly, Toby, I think it needs to be, um, a combination of the two. And, and the question is in, in what, what's the combination? And I almost like think about it as, um, you, it's like putting a jigsaw puzzle together. And this is not a, this is not one of those trite jigsaw puzzle analogies. It's once you get 70% of your puzzle, which means once you do 70% of the things that are available to you, then the puzzle starts to make sense. Still, you're 70% of the way through. You have no idea what that puzzle is. Right. But once you get to 70%, you're like, okay, now things are starting to make sense. I only need one piece here, one piece there. But um, I, I, what we're st- seeing a lot of is anytime we do something, Toby, in the traditional world specifically, we want to make sure we do it a little differently. So let's talk about that briefly. So if, if people are mailing in a neighborhood, there's nothing where the, the whole uh, – I just talked to the entire company about – you know, if I see a just sold postcard going out, I, I just bang my head against the wall because nobody cares about a just sold going out. What, what they're actually trying to communicate is if, if I'm an agent and I just sold something in, in your neighborhood, Toby, I want you to know, hey, Toby, I sold something here and here are the 10 reasons why I'm awesome. That's what I want to communicate as an agent. So instead of saying just sold one, two, three Main Street, right. we came up with this idea that said, you know, 65,000 Facebook impressions, 1,800 e-blasts, you know, 300 brokers, uh, four events, nine offers, eight counters, one buyer, uh, 17% over list price. Yes. You know, I'm, I'm your neighborhood expert, Toby Salgado. Yes. That's what, that's the just sold you want. Oh, man, I love that, man. I love it. And look, you know, going back to that whole sign thing, right? So, you know, you started this whole thing off, like, get, find that overpriced, just get your sign in the yard. You could actually, I, I don't know. I mean, look, it, it, I try to think of ways of hacks, right? So tell me what you think of this. It doesn't have to be, I would, I would say that, it, that if you want to send that postcard out, you know, uh, it really doesn't have to be your, your listing. Let's say somebody else sold it. Um, uh, you, you wouldn't have all those metrics, but, but uh, you know, you could – what do you think of that? Would it, would it piggybacking off of somebody else's um, uh, sale in, that, in your farm? You know, that's interesting. I, I, I might have to kind of uh, think about that a little bit more, but there's probably a way to say, you know, let's say, let's say Toby was your listing and it was my buyer. I, I could probably say, you know, 17 homes shown – you know, three offers written or something like that, right? Work down that math to show that, you know, I, I really represented a buyer really well. But some way to show that I, I think, I think uh, thoughtful process would, it, you want to show that thoughtful process and great strategy is what got to the extraordinary results. And they are hiring you for the thoughtful, thoughtful process and the, and, and the great strategy. And I think that's where your value comes. And once you show something like that, it, to me, in my opinion, if, if I were a listing agent, I would put together six case studies, and that would be the beginning of my listing presentation. Let me walk you through what I did down the street, what I did here, what I did here. It's the same strategy. This is what works, and this is what I'm going to do for you. And if you lay that out there, no client is going to argue, argue with you on commission ever because you just told them exactly all the effort that you're going to that you're going to put into marketing their farm and how you're going to track the results. There you go, man. That's why you only lost one. Um, I mean, I got. I mean, I, I'll, I'll tell you, man. If I sold real estate and I was in your market, I would want to work with you. I'd want to work with a guy who thinks like this. Oh, uh, thank you, Toby. I appreciate that. Well, I mean, this is to to me to me this is you know this is all by this is all client psychology, right? We wanted we want to do what's best for our clients, but at the same time, we need to generate leads and we need to generate good branding with our clients in mind, not our not ourselves in mind. I think agents are really. I, I think the sad part is there's a lot of broker branding going out there. Like one agent is trying to trump the other agent in a farm, and I think that's where the disconnect is happening. If if, if we think about, okay, well, I'm in my client's shoes, what can I do to influence them or appeal to them? I'll give you a really cool idea. Tom Ferry and I came up with this. And, you know, we had the, uh, every, about last, late last year, there was this, this thing going around, you know, um, 
there's low inventory, there's low inventory, now is a good time to sell. There's low inventory, now is a good time to sell. Every answer of why now is a good time to sell was because there was low inventory. And, and it, it, it just drove me nuts that every agent was saying that there's just low inventory. And it was not, and people don't realize that low inventory is a symptom of the imbalance between demand and supply. It's not the cause of why, you know, why we should list our house. And so we came up with this idea. We said, top seven reasons why now is a good time to sell. Now, while that is cool, here's what we did. We made seven postcards, seven email marketing pieces, you know, seven door knocker flyers, seven social media images. So now each of our agents had a 21 week campaign just built in. So all they had to do was tell marketing, Hey, I want it. Marketing picked the farm, you know, got their farm, got their list from title, put their personalized with their picture on it. And then every three weeks automatically sent out that card. We sent out 21 cards the first week and we got 19 callbacks. Wow. I've never, I've never even seen anything like that. And, and it's not because, you know, it's not because of anything but the fact that the, seven, the, the campaign was built to talk to the client. It was not built for agent or broker branding. Got it. Um, right. Okay. Um, so, I mean, 19 out of 21, I, that's like, like you could be saying, hey, I'll give you a free dinner and you wouldn't get that kind of. <laughs> that's right. I mean, I mean <laughs> what do you, but seriously, so you did this, um, uh, why... So look, is that replicatable or replicable um, with something else, or or did you did you just was the copy? Why did that happen? Do you think? Well, I I I I don't think it. I think we got. Um, I think there was so much demand, and the people really wanted to figure out what we were trying to accomplish. But is it replicatable? Yes, uh, in the same fashion. No, but I think. Go, I think we need to start doing things in campaigns. Uh, you, the, the one and done postcard does not work. Right. You have to say, hey, if I'm farming, I'm going to do a seven week campaign on why there's low inventory. I'm going to do a six week campaign on, on you know, uh, why this community is great, you know, the, the 10 great features of this community. I'm going to do a four week campaign on just market intelligence. Just something that is thoughtful and that keeps hitting people. You, know, you got to hit, hit them three or four times with a similar message to tie the story together. That's why this just listed just sold with no context really is, is a struggle for people receiving it. Every time my wife gets, you know, my wife's not even in a real estate. She gets a just listed or just sold it, and she just talk. every time whatever she tosses, I never see. Whatever she keeps are the ones that I see, and I'm so excited by that because somebody did something to get my wife's attention, which means I want to look at that postcard or direct mail piece in some way. Yeah, for sure. Um, so that that's I, I again, uh, you know, this 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 your show your episode is a bunch of firsts right so creating this campaign with you know with a narrative in mind right you know the the, the four week campaign around whatever um i would imagine uh, and i don't know if this is this is um this is intentional on your part but you know if you create this narrative this campaign with this this story in it you know uh, uh, what were you what you said earlier right people need to know you like you and then think you're smart um it, it, it seems like that you would have some some backlash on that, some, uh, some unintended positives in both knowing you, liking you, and thinking you're smart. Right, exactly, exactly. I mean, I'll, uh, hopefully, you're, I mean, ho- hopefully you know, there's, there's, some, there's some takeaways for, for your audience or agents here. We did an awesome expired campaign that's working in, in different parts of, of L.A. And have you, if you have not received this, Toby, I, I guarantee in your coaching you're going to get this, right? Someone will say, hey, Toby, do you have a great expired letter? And I I, I, I want to punch somebody that asked me for a great expired letter. <laughs> I mean, ser- like seriously, you, you, take a second and think about the psychology of the seller who ju- whose listing just expired. I mean, they, are, they were ready to put their home on the market. They went through the emotional trouble of putting their home on the market. Sure, it, it might have been overpriced, whatever reason, right? But they put their home on the market, they tr- entrusted an agent, they signed a listing agreement, they, you know, they, had, they, they, had inc- they were inconvenienced for showings, they, they saw their pro- property advertised, they felt rejected that nobody wanted their property. Yes. I mean, there was, there was a, a, a significant, there can't be a more complex psychological issue there, and you're going to write a letter that they're going to read? I mean, really? You know, <laughs> that, that makes no sense to me. But, 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 but that begs a question of, well, there is a way to appeal to them, right? So what did they want? They want, they want three things, right? They want, they want, I call it the three P's. They got people, process, and platform. What they want is they want to know that you are awesome. They want to know that Toby Salgado is awesome. And 
what they want someone with persistence. So let's say you're coming up with a four piece campaign. You say, Hey, my first piece is persistence. So something about how you, you know, how you have succeeded where others have failed and how something about persistence. The second is process. Why your plan is better than the plan that would happen before. Right? That's number two. And third is the platform. Do you have the track record? Do you have the infrastructure to execute on that? Number, number three, number four, um, is the testimonials. And I, I kind of did this and, and this might be a, this was a jerk move for me in, in a client meeting. And I said that, you know, Hey, we, in an expired client, uh, listing. And I said, uh, I said, Mr. And Mrs. Seller, we actually require that all our clients that come that have had a home, uh, their listing expire actually call one of our past clients before they actually hire me. I actually mandated that they call a past client. And, and, for to to for that testimonial, right? Exactly, because because nothing is going to make them feel more comfortable than talking to somebody that that you know that we had already served. But now you have a four piece campaign, if either email or direct mail or drop off or a book or what have you, uh, that that is not just a hey, your listing expired on Saturday. I'm going to send you a a listing presentation book with a, with a standard letter that I sign and just hope for you to call me. I mean, that just, that's ridiculous. Right, right. Know, not, yeah. I, I totally agree. But l- let me ask you this. So, you know, you, 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 you get into the cycle, you know, the, the psychographicness of your market and your people. Do you, um, when you say, Hey, listen, I'm not going to take your expired. I won't do it. I will not take your business until you call one of my past clients. You're creating, right? You're creating some friction there. You're creating some scarcity on their side, right? You're saying, Hey, I'm so good. I'm so, you know, I'm, I'm such so good at what I do. I will not, I won't work with you. Do you think, again, getting into the psychological reasons, you know, you again are creating scarcity there. Is that, Talk to me about, you know, does that help? I mean, for... Yeah, it, that's very intentional. You're, you're 100% right. It's very intentional. And it's, it, would, should we do it in other listing presentation environments? You know, probably not. I, you know, that's, 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 that's an unfair move, I think. And, you, you know, I, you don't want to kind of come off as, well, who is this guy who thinks he's awesome? That's not what we want. What we want here is, hey, these guys have gone through a six-month listing period of, of, of pure frustration, wouldn't it be great if they talked to, you know, my clients, the Salgados, who told them how well I took care of them? And how, that makes them feel so much better. So you, all you're trying to do is having them emotionally connect with you so that they can, th- that way if they need to make price reductions, if they need to actually listen to you, or if they need to change the process, they're a lot more open to that because that, now you have a, a client validating you. And yes, there's, there's a little bit of friction. And, if, and strangely, Toby, Every single one, you know, I only, I only did this once, but I expect that if I had an expired listing and, and, and the agent told me that I should call a past client and here's a list of 10 past clients, call anyone, I would just because I've gone through the process and I don't want to, I don't want to have my listing in the market for another six months and have it not sell. Right. Right. And by the way, it's super intuitive of you. I asked that question because I wanted to see if it would work in a different environment, you know, when you list and you answer that without me getting there. So... <clears throat> Listen, you have you have this interesting uh, football team example to inside out market dominate in a farm. What talk to us a little about about this? Well, this is uh, I'm I'm a uh, I love I love I love football. I, I love kind of the the um, you know the the NFL and and it's it's more a it's more us trying to for the football folks on the, on, on on listening to your show. Uh, hopefully this, this, this means something, right? So what, here's how I think about the world. If you always need, if us as the agent looking at geographic farming, say we are the quarterbacks, we are trying to figure out the strategy of how to run this, this football team. Um, I think of G, I think of, uh, the, the, the outbound mailers and, you know, the, the drops and the postcards and the signs, et cetera, as, as running backs, that is, they are, they're, it's just hard to do. You don't get a lot of, you know, you might get a yard or two here and there, but you have to do it over and over and over again. The consistency of always having a running back just pound through that defense is so very important. I think of, you know, door knocking and open houses as tight ends where, 
you get you get a lot more action with the people. So you get you might you, you might you might you might get a first down here and there. You might get a lot more yardage, and it's a good breakup and from the from just just pounding the running back. My personal favorite analogy is you know these high paid wide receivers, right? So you're paying you're paying these wide receivers a lot of money, same way where you pay for a ton, you pay you pay to buy a zip code on Zillow, Realtor, or Trulia, and but but the cost per conversion is much higher, so you might you might be paying a lot more for that, but chances are you're going to get a lot more leads from it. So I look at kind of the syndicators and paid leads as wide receivers. Now these are the two these other two things that are, are interesting to me is I look at our our sphere of influence as um, as our defense. Their job is just to keep you in the hunt and on the field. All that, all that your, you know, your attorneys, your accountants, uh, your insurance guys, anybody that is your friends, your family, whatever, their job is to continuously get your referrals and leads so that you can be on the field at all times. That's all their job is. And that's what I think about them as, you know, their defensive job is keeping the offense on the field as much as possible. And I think our past clients are like special teams. Anytime, anytime you get a referral from a past client, I mean, it's, it's like, thank you very much, boom, done. Right, so special teams are are the easiest money. So uh, that's kind of in a broad way how I think about it. And there's no way you can do this without an integrated approach. So you you have to nurture your sphere, you have to nurture your past clients, and you have to do the you know you have to do things that don't seem to have immediate results, like like the like the mailers, the drops, the postcards, the signs. But you know we have a new agent team that 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 we uh, that joined us recently. They do a lot of these. They do a lot of outbound stuff: mailers, drops, postcard signs, etc. But they do no door knocking or open houses or anything like that. Well, it's hard because you will they will get there eventually, but it's just going to take them a lot more time if they don't have any tight ends on their team to get the door knocking and the open houses going. Amazing, you know. And look, and it's and, and it's and it's the door knocking and open house. All that stuff's free. Right. And, and it's right. The, it's the stuff that you send out that costs money. And, and it's, it's amazing that, that, you know, you know, your tight ends and your example, door knocking open houses is the thing that the thing that people fail to do, even though it's free, man. It's just you know what it is. It's work. That's what people that, that's really the thing that, that stops people from winning. Right. Is not putting in the work. Well, I, I, I think you're 100 percent right. Toby. And I also think it's, you know, uh, people have uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of I'm a big fan of coaching in our world. Um, n- 17 out of our top 21 agents right now are in some form of formal coaching program, which, is, which, which means a lot to me. 20 out of the 20 of our bottom 20 agents do not, are not in any coaching, which is very interesting to me. So our bottom 20 agents have, are not in any coaching, and our 17 out of our top 21 are in, are in some structured coaching, which, which means a lot to me. And, and what I mean by that is, is I think if, if, if agents know what to say at the door or – what to say during an open house, or why they're doing door knocking, it makes, it makes people more apt to doing it. Now, I, I know our top agent in L.A. has never knocked on a door or will never knock on a door because his business is modeled in a different way. But interestingly, he doesn't have a geographic farm. So I don't know of anybody out there that has a geographic farm and does zero door knock, does, and does not do door knocking. I just haven't. I don't know that. So they have to. You have to be at the doors in some way. Maybe inviting people to an event, or just sharing market updates, or heck, just dropping off market updates at the door, or something of value to them. Right. Because you've got to hit them in se- in several different ways, and that's the on- that's the only way to have. You know, that's the only way to touch people, and they got to see. Toby Salgado everywhere, yes. and only then you're recognized as a market expert. They got to see you everywhere on Facebook when they log in. They got to see your signs. They got to see your door drops. They got to see your postcards, um, and you know they got to they got to know you, like you, and trust you, and think you're smart. So the the know you part is the most expensive for a while, and you kind of have to do it. Well, so so uh, so the the 17 out of the top 20 of your people have coaches. The bottom 20, none. I mean, like, what, what is the math? I mean, I, I don't, I, like, in terms of the psychology of that bottom 20, what do you think that is? Why is it uh, that, 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 you know, they can look at somebody and they're like, I wish I had that person's business. I wish I had that person's life. <clears throat> and the, the simple thing of getting a coach is the, is the one thing that they're doing and I'm not. Why? I mean, I don't, I don't understand. Like, can you give me some insight into why the yeah, bottom 20? So, yeah, so I, I think it's, um, I, I'm, I'm, this is very subjective knowledge, but I think that uh, they've either not met 
a coach that they have connected with or worse, they tried to get coaching and they had a really bad experience. Um, and, and I think that's really hard for a lot of people. For example, I, I mean, I, I, as, a, as a non-selling principal of the firm, I don't need a coach, but I met, I met Tom Ferry in, a, you know, in happenstance. It was not even structured in a way. And Tom took me on, and, and Tom took me and my partner Peter Hernandez on, and, and we are you know, one of his eight personal coaching clients, and it's been a phenomenal learning experience for me because now I get to run all my ideas by Tom, and, um, and, and you know, he gets a chance to kind of brainstorm with me. So I'd say my aptitude for this business has tremendously improved and my productivity and my impact on the firm has skyrocketed after I've, after I've begun coaching. Right. Right. You know, look, uh, I have, you know, I was just say, you know, I have a coach. I don't need one, but I have one. And, uh, you know, I, I run stuff by him and it's amazing for my guy. Uh, he never really helps me with anything, but he, I swear, man, he's kind of like, you know, we have this Friday call. He's like therapy for me. <laughs> you know, you know, Toby. Sometimes, sometimes you need that. I mean, you know, some. I think uh, some coaching programs are structured around, um, are, are just structured around guidance, right? So, hey, you should do these three things. Right. Others are structured around um, uh, accountability. Hey, you need to do these three things, but you're going to call me every morning and tell me what you did. The others are structured around just a, a brainstorming type environment, and that's maybe that's what people need. I think it's important for a lot of folks out there, especially on the call, to 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 to, to understand to figure out what kind of person you are because the, 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 the return of investment on coaching is, 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 is absolutely amazing, but it, it, it needs, you need to figure out what kind of person you are and what you connect with from a, from a coaching or development standpoint. I always think about it as, you know, did I like my football coach in high school or did I like my tennis coach who was more a team coach or did I like the brainstorming group that I'm in right now? So just trying to figure out what, um, what forum helps you best. I, I think that can guide you towards kind of figuring out the right coach. And you know what? I, I'll actually make it, make an open statement to anyone on the call. If, if, uh, and you're welcome, you know, to share my information. If anybody wants to kind of brainstorm with me about what type of, coaching environment might be the best fit for them. I probably know every single model uh, that is generally out there. I'm, I'm happy to, you know, happy to be counsel and third party advisor to, to point them in the right direction. Wow. That is really cool, man. Um, and by the way, look, that, uh, and, and, and I'll tell you, Sharon, I'll say it publicly right now. I want to start using you more, right? I, I want to start running some of my ideas for this show and my, and, and my model by you more. So I'm, 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 so are you okay with that? No, happy, happy to do it. Hey, <laughs> you, I, I, you do, Toby, I, and, and hopefully I know your audience um, is, is, is here and listening to you because of the great work that you do. They're very, there are not a lot of people who, who do what you do. I don't think a lot of people understand how long it takes for you to do what you do. I mean, you and I, you and I, this is, a, you know, this is the, our first recording, but you've, you and I have spent probably three, four hours already just working on ideas together. You're going to probably spend another half an hour to an hour just in simple editing and post-production. Then you're going to write a blog. I mean, by the time you produce a show, you've gone through 10, 15, 20 hours worth of work for someone to listen to a 30, 35, 40 minute show. And I don't think people realize how much value that you're <laughs> providing them. And I really, really appreciate what you do for the community and, and just, you know, not in the, the level of intelligence and integrity up for all the agents out there. So thank you for what you do. Yeah, no, thank you, buddy. You know, and you're right. And look, here's the hardest part for me. It is, you know, I, I do have all that post-production, that pre production all that stuff. The hardest part, man, is, is, you know, reaching out to people like you and saying, listen, I, you know, telling people what I do, I have this radio show and I would love to have you on. You know, somebody referred you to me, what, however I get to you. And, um, and you know, it, it, people, I don't know, man, that's the hardest part is even just getting people on the show. Because even when I, then, then, you know, then I'll get with them and we'll, we'll have a conversation and people are skeptical. They don't know what it, this is. And they're like, you know, they think that I have some kind of agenda and I'm, and I'm like, I don't, right? I just want to share your story. So that really is the hardest part. That's the thing that, that uh, takes uh, way more time than, than, than so. Anyhow, going back to, to what you said earlier, Sean, I, I have to tell you, right, for someone to find out, right, what they need, right? Do you need an accountability coach? Do you need, right, like this, uh, you know, just brainstorming coach, whatever it is. 
I've had Tom, Bob Cork, Tom Ferry, Mike Ferry, Bob Corcoran, uh, lots of high level coaches. And I asked, I, I try to, I, you and your advice is the most actionable, the most, like, in terms of really helping people know how to choose a coach. That was the best thing I've ever heard. Ever. Oh, thank you. I mean, thank you. I appreciate that. And, and, and <laughs> Toby, this is more. This is more because I was really skeptical, and and I didn't. I didn't think that I ever needed one or wanted one, and until I met Tom, and, and our personalities really synced. And so I appreciate. You know, Tom's done wonders for me, and I didn't really realize uh, that I could benefit from something like that, and until it actually happened for me, because I was very skeptical before. Which is the only. I'm only sharing it because I went through that path of being skeptical, and. Um, and 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 that it, it's more it's more trans you know transferring the 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 experience that I had to your audience. So hopefully it's helpful to them. Yeah, for sure. Look, as we wrap this up, uh, you know, I'm going to ask you a question that I don't ask everybody, but but when people like you come on that just are, you know, are just you know fountains of good stuff, it's this. Um, what's something I didn't ask you that I should have asked you? Um. Well. It, we can go. We can go two ways in this, right? I think number one. I, 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 like, maybe I'll maybe I'll answer that two ways. Okay. Philosophically, philosophically, I think that it's really important for people to understand the psychology of lead generation, and our business is all about lead generation. Because Toby, we know a lot of agents who are really who are not great agents, as in the craft of real estate, not great deal agents, but they make a boatload of money. We also know a lot of agents that are very, very good deal agents that make no money, which, which in a sense, to me, it means that lead generation is very, very important. Now, the, 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 answer, the psychology of lead generation to me is this. You, you offer a prospect something of value or maybe just tease their curiosity, and in return, they give you time to either contact them or pitch them. As soon as we understand that you offer somebody something of value or tease their curiosity, and in return they give you time to contact them or pitch them, that is the very foundation of our business. And I'll, I'll tell you why, and you, you're going to think I'm totally off the rails when I say this, is because let's say I offered you something of value. Let's say I said, you know, uh, Toby, there are 10 homes that sold in your community uh, at over asking call me for a free home valuation. You're like, hey, it looks like this guy sold 10 homes. I'm going to call Sharon. Well, when you call me and let's say you have a bad experience with me. Well, that is terrible. And I'll tell you why. Every time we blow it, we blow it not just for ourselves, but for everyone that comes after us, regardless of what they're selling, because the more often a prospect is sold a bad product or worse, a bad experience, the they are they're lesser they're more and more skeptical about giving others a chance to pitch yep and and that really breaks my heart because that's why i really want when people do lead generation or people when i hand somebody a lead or when i give somebody a referral i always ask them i say can you please tell me what you're going to do what are the next four steps that you're going to do to manage this relationship because that reflects on me and i don't want our clients to have a bad experience and and I just think that if we can get, get kind of behind the psychology of lead generation saying you have to offer something of value to get something back, that just changes the ballgame completely. I agree. And look, and the other piece of that is if, if uh, and the, you know, it, so we, with whatever leads we get, right, whether that's 100 a month or, or two months, whatever, those have value. They're, they're worth something, right? They're, and you've spent money, you've spent time, you spent energy going out and trying to get that lead. Now you have it, and then you know, for you to blow it as, a, as an agent out there, that's, that's, that, you know, that's terrible. That's terrible not only for everybody who comes after you, but, but for you yourself. And, I, and I, you know, look, this, we could go on and on. We could get into tracking and all that stuff. It's all connected. <clears throat> Sharon, man, thanks for coming on the show. Uh, you know, you listen, so you know the one question I'm going to ask you. I'm an aspiring agent. I have 25 bucks. What book should I go, I go get? Um, I think we talked about this platform, uh, Get Noticed in a, noisy vo- in a Noisy World by Michael Hyatt. Just, it's, the, it's, it's, the, it's the Bible for building a great platform in, in today's world. Awesome. And look, if anybody wants a copy of that, a free copy of that, just use our link, audibletrial.com slash superagentslive. So, Sharon, 
uh, you you made this generous offer that you'd, you're willing to spend some time with uh, people trying to figure out sort of, you know, their own kind of what they need in terms of finding a coach. How do people go out and find you and say thank you for coming on this show? Oh, thank you, Toby. Thanks for having me. The easiest way to get a hold of me is um, it's Sharon.me. That's S-H-A-R-R-A-N dot M-E. And that has a listing of um, kind of all the ways to get a hold of me and all the social media vehicles and all of that. So um, that's probably the easiest way. And our company is TellusProperties.com. That's T-E-L-E-S Properties.com. And that has all my contact information as well. Happy to be helpful as long as folks refer uh, that they heard, um, you know, me and you chatting, and this is from the show. I, I'm I'm very happy to take time to spend with them and be helpful in any way. Awesome, and look, I'm sure you're always looking for talent. So somebody's out there in your market. Uh, uh, where are you? You told you said it earlier, but where are you? Sure. Yeah, so I'll I'll, I'll re- shoot off all the all the locations. So we're uh, we're as far north as Carmel, Carmel on the Central Coast, Montecito in the Santa Barbara area, Beverly Hills, Brentwood, um, it, it, Venice. Playa del Rey, Pasadena, Monrovia, Burbank, Newport, uh, Newport Beach, and Laguna. So if you're in any of those areas and uh, you're looking for a great company to work with, reach out to Sharon. Sharon? Awesome. Thank you, Toby. Thank you, my man. I'll talk to you soon. All right. Thanks, Toby. See you, bud. Let's go.